very good afternoon uh, to everyone. Can good you? Afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And and uh, we are delighted to meet here again uh, with a large group of high school students uh, coming from many different schools in Hong Kong. Um, we are here to see a pitching and judging event for the NASA Space Apps Challenge Hackathon. So this NASA Space Apps Challenge Hackathon was held last weekend and we have shortlisted six teams with very strong entries. And what is very surprising is that five of these entries come from high school students, high schoolers. So it is a very educational experience to learn from others, to hear from others what they have done and how they pitch, how they sell, and what have they created. So that is the idea for today's um, session. We are going to see a lot of very fascinating um, solutions that go towards uh, addressing the challenges um, in this NASA Space Apps Hackathon. So we have six teams and uh, we have also judges from the hackathons who are here today for this session. I see some of them. Um, let me introduce um, some of the judges. Um, Mr. Anthony uh, Chicharo from the US Consulate General, Hong Kong and Macau. Thank you, uh, Tony, for coming. Um, Mr. Charles Mock, everyone knows him, right? Um, Charles, Charles, are you there? Um, he may join us. And um, we also have two representatives, uh, Mr. Todd Bryan and Mr. Uh, Greg Friendy Fury from the American Chamber of Commerce. Hi, Todd. Hi, Greg. Hello. Hi. And also, we have a remote judge, right? Um, because of time difference, she's not available now, and myself. And <clears throat> we also have um, Professor Jia and Professor Kuo from uh, CDU. Uh, who sits on the judging panel. So the judges will be, will be here, right, to listen to the pitch from the six teams. And so without further ado, let me very briefly go through those six teams. They are Conserve to Preserve, <coughs> Cosmopho, Forest Fire Prevention Team, Hefkaton, Sunflower Coconut. These are the five high schooler teams. And last, we have UNI, which is a college student team. So let's start, right? Alex, are you there? Okay, so Alex is the chairman of the NASA Space Apps Challenge. Um, so if he's not here, then let me um, be, the, be the MC. So the first team is, uh, let me see, Conserve to Preserve, are you there? Yes, yes. we are here. Yep. So. Um, you have five minutes, everyone. So you have five minutes to present and demo. And then after that, another five minutes of Q&A. For the Q&A, I welcome everyone here, everyone in this session to pose the questions to the presenter so that they can, they can address your questions. And that will also form part of the judging um, um, criteria. So the judges are going to make up their mind by the end of this uh, um, by the end of the session, okay? So we have five minutes. I'm going to uh, keep track of the time as well. So uh, conserve to preserve, five minutes. So um, let me stop the screen so you can share screen. Uh, Manfa, are you there? Can you enable uh, screen sharing for those teams? Everybody can screen share. Oh, that's great. So conserve to preserve. Go ahead. So hi, we are Conserve to Preserve and we look forward to introducing you our product to our project. Um, next slide. You, you would like to introduce yourself, right? So everyone here, uh, each team, introduce yourself first and then um, go into the presentation. Um, so I'm Ottilie. I'm Athena. I'm Ashna. Uh, I'm Hugo. Um, and we also had like an extra team member, but he sadly and unfortunately is not able to be here today. Uh, he has um, previous arrangements and he cannot make the time to be here. Uh, apologies for that. Um, so our team consists of five and a year 11 students from South Island School in Hong Kong. And we're all very passionate about combating the threat of climate change through using mathematics and computer science. 
So our mission statement is a world uneducated is a world futile. And what we hope to convey through this phrase is the importance of educating the younger generation about climate change, because in the end, they will be the ones who are going to suffer the consequences of climate change. And therefore, we have developed an interactive and educational game, which we will talk more about later on. And it aims to show the player the consequences of some of the everyday actions they take. And it also teaches them how they can make better decisions in order to live a more environmentally friendly life. So the first step of our project was to conduct research on climate change. So on this slide, we looked at some of the biggest greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. We also looked at human activities that produce carbon emissions and measured how much exactly they produce annually, which we used in our game later on. And um, on this slide, we did research on the rate of carbon emissions in different countries in the world. Uh, so um, some ways to like approximate the amount of carbon dioxide in a certain area. So like there was like a, a bio biological way, which is to use uh, lichen species to determine whether the amount of carbon dioxide in an area is like concentrated or not concentrated as um, some lichen species can only uh, survive and like they will like uh, reproduce quicker and have like, greater rates of reproduction in certain areas with higher uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide. But like some other species of lichen can't survive in high concentrations of carbon dioxide and can only survive in lower concentrations. So like the pros of this, it's that like you don't require you don't require any equipment to actually determine the carbon dioxide concentration in that area. You just need like your brain and maybe like a booklet saying like what lichen species matches to what concentration. Uh, but like the cons are, it requires lichen and lichen's not easy to find. It's like it's like pretty rare in like cities and it's not actually that accurate. Um, an another way of doing, another way of calculating the amount of carbon in like an area is to use carbon probes and gauges, and uh, that can be done anywhere and is quite accurate, but it requires scientific equipment. The previous climate shows a Gaussian distribution in the curve, which means distribution is symmetrical. There's the same amount of colder than average weather as there is hotter than average. And it also means that weather that is average in temperature occurs more frequently than the extremes. The new climate curve shows a shift in both mean and variance. This means that not only does distribution get more spread out, meaning more extreme weathers, but there's also a shift to the right. This shift indicates more record hot weather. The trend in temperatures of Hong Kong remains consistent with global trends. Per decade, temperatures are rising. And as we can see from the red line, as of more recently, this trend has accelerated. This can be attributed to climate change and Hong Kong's local urbanization effect. As of data collected in 2019, total emissions of Hong Kong were 40,600 kilotons, taking into account the approximately 7.5 million people that live in Hong Kong, our emissions per capita was 5.4 tons. The sectors that had the largest contributions to these greenhouse gas emissions were electricity generation, which made up 66% of total emissions, transportation sector, which made up 18% of total emissions, and waste management, which made up 7% of total emissions. In order to effect effectively combat global warming, we must drastically reduce our carbon emissions and global and greenhouse gas emissions as a whole. In to do this, we must replace fossil fuels with renewable energy or nuclear energy. Nuclear energy emits virtually no carbon compared to every other major energy source and is more efficient than renewables as it can run 24 seven. As 90% of Hong Kong's electrical consumptions comes from our buildings, the green building is essential to Hong Kong especially. Green building means to utilize solar energy in order to maximize air quality and minimize usage of toxic materials. The sponge city is a plan to improve our drainage systems in order to minimize the negative impact natural disasters such as floods will have on the city which is important considering the frequency of these natural disasters will increase as climate change gets worse. 
The Smart City is a long-term plan that seeks to improve the citizens' quality of life by improving Hong Kong's economy, economy and, and sustainability. This plan entails better transportation management, better welfare systems such as healthcare, incorporating more renewable energy into our system, educated citizens and government, as well as a modernized new economy that relies on technology. Uh, so we created these questions based on the large factors that contribute to carbon emissions in Hong Kong, such as um, in question 10 and 13, where we considered waste management. And so we ranked the severity of the options, uh, the most severe as in the choice that would lead to the most carbon emissions is option A, and the one that would lead to the least carbon emissions is option C. Based on which, based on the majority of your answers, uh, you would lead, it would lead to a different carbon emission rate, which would be displayed at the end of the game. Um, in order to calculate the emissions of each option, we looked into, for example, in question, um, in the transportation question, we looked into average distances to school from home, and we multiplied that by the speed to get emissions. And uh, since there are always uncertainties, we cannot be sure that these numbers are entirely accurate, especially since we used averages. Um, we have three minutes for Q and A, so would you like to wrap up? Hi, uh, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm more... okay. Um, so how are people in underdeveloped countries affected? So, uh, if you chose major, like, if you chose like an option of majority A, then well, the global temperature will rise over three point two degrees Celsius, and um, that is bad for many different things, such as like climate changes and everything happens badly. Um. Option, if most of the things are option B, then wildfires will happen and like uh, people in underdeveloped countries will not have access to clean water. Um, if option C happened, if like mostly you selected option C, uh, well, you are like a lover of the environment. You are like, you, the environment won't be affected that much. And um, the, well, there would still be some effects, but it wouldn't be as like dangerous to like, a lot of people yeah yeah maybe let's stop the presentation now and go to q and a hi i'm warren um i want to ask you a qu question that um i i joined the nasa space apps hackathon and i made a game can i um like um put that game that i've submitted in nasa space hackathon into this project Um, you, you muted yourself. Uh, Warren, are you part of this team? Um, what do you mean? Uh, I, 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 um, I participated in the, um, Space App Hackathon. I'm sorry, Warren, are you part of this team, Conserve to Preserve? Um, what, what is Conserve to Preserve? Okay, Warren, uh, let's talk about this later on. Okay, so now my question to, um, Conserve to Preserve team, um, do you have anything to demo? Uh, no. Uh, software, software. Program. Programmer. I'm just reading from slides. Yeah, our programmer doesn't, well, he couldn't export like the file, the, like the image files and we couldn't, we couldn't get like, like a, our code running. We do have code, but like. Okay, cool, uh, let's pass the question to the other judges. Any um, question from the judge? Uh, this is Todd Bryant, uh, if I could ask a question. Um, by the way, really impressive quantitative analysis and use of data. I, I was really impressed by that in the presentation. And just going back to, to some of the scoring criteria, when, when you present, when someone takes the test and then uh, or plays the game and then gets the results, is this going to give them some very concrete action items that they should start doing the next day 
to try to help lower their carbon footprint. So at the end, we provide ways and methods that each person can take into account for how to live a greener lifestyle based on the options they took. And yeah. And it will, will it prioritize that? I mean, is it going to say, you know, you really, this is where you got to focus more over this area. You know, you really fundamentally have an issue here that you could work on. Uh, so like, I'm not really sure the how like, the code that we did works. Was all based. Oh, sorry. My bad. It was based specifically in Hong Kong. So then the data is more specific and it gives, um, it's from the research that we conducted. So there are methods where we've taken down notes for methods of how the government can improve, how individuals can improve. And there were small steps that everyone can take listed um, at the end of the game. Great. No, it's very engaging. And again, very, really impressed with the detailed analysis that you put behind it. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, let's go to the next team, Team Cosmopher. Are you ready? Yeah, um, I'm just um, um, What kind of team is that? How can I join a team? Oh, I'm right. kind of confused. So let's talk about this later, okay? So let's talk towards the end. Okay. Um, so uh, remember again to highlight each team has 10 minutes. So five minutes of presentation plus demo and hopefully another five for Q&A. So if you need more time for your presentation, it's going to eat into your Q&A. Um, yeah, are you good? So, your screen. Great. So I'm going to start the clock now. Here, here, you can start. Okay, great. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Ashwarya, and this is my partner, Ria, and we are presenting Project Cosmover. So first, the challenge. Under the umbrella terms inform and inspire, we chose to specifically target a problem that required us to illustrate the best of NASA's research revolving around the essential yet undermined field known as Earth science, as well as data around NASA's numerous missions. Today, more than ever, major opportunities and problems are tied to Earth science, aerospace, and to our understanding of it. As students ourselves, we truly understood the significance of gaining reliable and valid information. And so we idealized Project Cosmover. So in a tight nutshell, Cosmofer is an application that seeks to make Earth science and NASA's data accessible, engaging, and interactive. So we've um, co coded and programmed a quick prototype um, within the duration of this hackathon. So Cosmofer's user journey begins with a clean, interactive interface with facts and figures laced in between loading pages for learning on the go. Prominent NASA launch missions are then accessed through the Discover page, where users can are effectively able to filter results based on time period, relevance, and geographic location. Learning about outer space has never been easier. A quick press onto a mission of choice leads the viewers to an overview of the mission, with its time period, purpose, and appropriate visuals clearly laid out. References are evidently addressed, and the user is provided with several links should they be interested in further reading. While not an existing aspect, a mini interactive activity for each mission, such as trivia quizzes, is something we plan on incorporating. So the world of aerospace is constantly developing, with a new mission or anniversary being celebrated every other day. As a part of our day in history, we've integrated a quick overview of prominent dates in space. As can be seen in the example, further links to celebrate, read more on, or view live sightings are linked too. So obviously quantitative data is undoubtedly just as important as the information itself. And this is included as a daily metrics page where um, used directly from NASA's Earth Science resources with further information about what these metrics usually actually mean for those who don't know. Finally, with a special emphasis on Earth Science, we clearly saw the need to utilize NASA's core initiatives targeted at planetary dilemmas and publicize them in a concise way such that users are encouraged to take part and read more on what they should do to save the Earth and why they should do it. So how exactly does Cosmofer tackle the challenge at hand? The challenge asks for an interface that informs the user of information about NASA's space explorations, 
in the eyes of a historian and educator. And we're doing exactly that with our Today in Space page. And the ability to effortlessly filter results based on the user's desired time and location. The challenge further asks for an interface that is interactive in nature. We do this with our simple and easy na to navigate system. Finally, the challenge culminates with the integration of NASA and its subsidiaries' extensive databases. Cosmopher brings this to life with easy links to NASA's live sightings, further reading options, and mapping data that is incorporated directly from NASA's Earth data website. Cosmopher's target demographic encompasses anybody and everybody. Every person is able to have a different takeaway and benefit. As a result of our simple interface, as well as the increase in tech usage and knowledge within the youth, we are able to spark an, an, an inherent interest towards the conservation of our planet, as well as astronomy and the next generation of problem-solving scientists. This is the impact that we strive to make with Cosmofer. In fact, the benefits of Cosmofer are not simply confined to a certain age group. For older users, we are able to actively inform them of different NASA initiatives in relation to the universe, all the more publicizing prominent issues about our home. Evolving concerns such as climate change, forest fires, carbon footprints, and several other issues are crucial points of conversation that we as citizens of the planet should be discussing. As an application, we drive our users to not only become educated in these issues, but encourage them to truly enact change within their respective communities. So as you can see, Cosmofer is a project that is incredibly scalable in nature. If given the opportunity to take this project forward over an extended period of time, some additions we could possibly inaugurate would be the following. Some features we've considered are simple carbon footprint calculators, exemplifying the interactive aspect through games based on the user's lifestyle. Pertaining to our diverse target demographic, we aim to introduce quizzes with difficulty levels respective to the age group. For an example, a simple matching game for younger children regarding climate change, whilst for older users, a more factual-based one. Location-based notifications is also something that Cosmofer would definitely benefit from in the future, with specific notifications tailored to the geographic location of the users. That concludes our presentation. Once again, we would like to thank you so much for this opportunity, and we hope that Cosmofer is an idea that we can take forward with the NASA Space Apps Challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and um, my question is, can you give a demo of the software? Yeah, sure. So um, this was kind of the prototype that we um, coded and programmed like throughout the hackathon. So obviously this is the home page. Um, you've got Did You Know Facts for On The Go Learning, um, you can discover missions that are, you know, presented in bite-sized um, problems so you can learn on the go. There's the overview of the mission, what you can do about it, as well as further links to reading. Um, there's a day in space page for targeting the historian aspect of the challenge. Um, quantitative information presented in a really easy to um, read manner. It's super easy for all age groups and, you know, um, there's nothing really that you can't find on our app. Um, and finally, with, the, um, with a special emphasis on the conservation of the Earth and the planet, um, and especially given that NASA has almost 15 different initiatives targeted at planetary conservation, um, we thought why not incorporate these within our app and encourage um, our users to take part in it through further reading and access to all of these links. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So these are snapshots, right? Not real programs. <clears throat> um, this is programmed. It's um, using an, an application, which is where we programmed the layout and then the buttons that lead to the different pages. Can you run the program? Run it now, like press the get started so that it goes to the next thing. Yeah, sure. So um, let's say you wanted to get the tempo, you can do that. So that was essentially what we did over the course of the hackathon. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, 
I pass the stage to other judges. Hi, Cosmo. For that was um that was a really great presentation. Thank you um for for sharing with us. I think um one of the things I just noted in general was that you you're trying to target a bunch of different audiences, and I think that's that's going to be a challenge and, and something for you guys to consider um as you move forward. But um given that that is your goal at this point, it seems like you have a way to determine which audience to target based on their interests. Age, but specifically, what information do users and how do you plan on storing that in a way that? Apologies, I think the last part of the question cut off. Could you just repeat that? Oh, sure. Uh, what type of information do you plan to gather from your users? Are you, are you gathering names, ages, email addresses, interests? And then um, how are you planning on storing that data so that you are protecting um, the, the privacy of your users? Um, so when collecting initial data, when um, the user first downloads and launches the app, we don't intend on taking in any names. Um, so like on the homepage, it simply says, welcome Cosmifer. It doesn't like, it doesn't have any personal data, but when launching the app, they are able to, uh, they're able to state their age if they want to. They're able to um, select what they want to get from this. So whether they're more to whether they're more interested in the astronomy side of the app or more interested in the um, issues on or global issues or everything in general. So, but all of the information is going to be um, displayed on the app in the sense that you are able to easily find which one you're more interested in while whilst also having the other option at hand. Yep. So just to add on, we we're obviously maintaining complete anonymity throughout the app. It's simply to direct your interests and um, to allow us to provide you with a more personalized experience so that, you know, let's say you wanted to use it as an education tool, we could do that for you. Yep, I think that concludes our presentation then. Okay, thank you. Any other question from the judge or from the other students? Uh, can I ask a quick question, uh, Todd Bryan again? Uh, also, I find it very interesting, your application. Um, I, I'm a kind of a nerd. I, I like trivia. I love history. I love stuff about state, space exploration. I find all that really fascinating. I remember as a kid watching all that on television. Um, I'm wondering what's your thoughts more deeply on what what applications will people use this for? I mean, knowing the history of, of different NASA missions and things like that is really fascinating. But what will people? What do you want people to use that use that information for? How would you like them to apply that information? So, as we mentioned previously in our presentation, we use the theme inform and inspire. So, informing is one aspect for um, obviously, like as you said, informing them of different NASA missions. But Inspire is the second part of our application in which we inspire our users to take change or come up with new innovative ideas. So in our homepage, we um, discuss prominent issues, like global issues such as carbon footprints, um, climate change, so on and so forth. So the users are able to understand that and they also have links to different pages where they can create change or different options such as what they can do on an individual small scale as well such as um such as vegan recipes or like not vegan recipes but like easier recipes or like easier methods that they can do on an individual scale yeah. thank you thank you so uh, let's go to the next team the third team Team Forest Fire Prevention. Thank you. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, cool. Your time starts now. I'm sorry, uh, not yet. I, not yet, sorry. Just wait a minute and we will start to present. Uh, yes. We will start soon, but uh, we're facing some technical issues. Um. How, how about um, 
one of you present this, uh, this slide that you have just opened and share, and while the others prepare the demo. So remember, I asked for demo. Is it okay? I finished the demo and it can work really. You can use it really. But oh, if oh, that's but not it's not because of time issue. Let's so I will, I will share that first, is it? So uh, team forest fire prevention, are you ready again? Yes. 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes. Um, actually, I think we we are facing some technical issues now. Um, so do you want to give up or you want to go to the next team? Yeah, I will share it now. I will share the demo first. You you're going to do the demo and the presentation, right? So it's going all to all together. It's going to be part of the ten minutes, right? So I'm um, actually, I'll start now. Okay, cool. Start. Hello, judges and spectators. We're the Forest Prevention Team of the Spot the Fire Three Point Zero Challenge, and today we will talk about our plan to stop forest fires. Okay, so recently we hear a lot about different wildfires happening all over the world. Some of these wildfires bring a great deal of damage to buildings and property and may even kill lots of animals and humans. For example, the devastating Australian bushfires, which have became global news in 2019 to 2020, have burned more than 18 million hectares of area and affected almost 3 billion vertebrate animals. Another example of destructive wildfires is a California wildfire caused by a gender review party this year. The fire started small, but it went out of control and eventually spread to different areas. It had burned more than 20,000 acres of land and had also killed a firefighter. In order to prevent more lives and property from being affected by wildfires, many efforts have been done to put out the wildfires and to prevent future fires. Therefore, our team joined this challenge to help prevent wildfires from spreading and to identify areas with a huge risk of wildfires. As mentioned before, wildfires can be extremely devastating to people and buildings. However, although wildfires and forest fires damage lots of property and affect lots of life, the fires usually start small. A single spark of a tiny flame can cause a devastating wildfire if it was left unextinguished. Given the right temperature, humidity, and conditions, a tiny fire can spread rapidly, burning through lots of acres of land. Flammable materials like dry leaves and twigs in the flame surroundings can also help the fire spread. For example, the previously mentioned California wildfire was caused by a flame which was ignited by a smoke-generating device used to reveal the gender of a baby. The flame started small, but it wasn't extinguished quick enough. The fire soon spread to other areas, and it was already too late when the firefighters arrived. Our goal is to develop an would... application and a device which detects fires, stops them from spreading, and predicts potential fire starting places. We hope to design something which can reduce the um, impact of wildfires on humanity and the ecosystem. Our mission is to greatly reduce the amount of devastating wildfires by putting them out before they can spread to other areas and by detecting and monitoring potential fire hazards in the wild. We also hope to collect different data and satellite images of the fires and analyze them in order to devise plans for preventing and stopping future fires. To achieve our goal and <coughs> mission of reducing the impacts of wildfires, we designed a system called Wildfire Begone, a professional wildfire prevention system, which consists of two parts. The first part is an application which notifies the users and authorities about different wildfires and potential fire hazards near them based on devices placed in different parts, forests, mountains, and other wild areas. There will also be devices which are made out of cameras, temperature sensors, humidity sensors, and soil humidity sensors placed on trees, fences, light poles, and other places in wild areas. Some of the devices will also be attached to animals and drones, which will be sent to survey the area routinely. The devices will detect small flames and sparks or potential fire hazards based on the data it received through its sensors and will notify different people and the authorities through the application. The device will also try to put out the fire of a small scale on its own, which may otherwise grow into something bigger. Using the mini fire extinguisher attached to it, 
which is bay water or foam, according to the severity of the fire at the detected spark or flame to extinguish it. If the fire is of a large scale, authorities can be notified of the fire's severity and its details through the application. Then the authorities can decide to notify the users of the applications to do different actions according to the situation. Related organizations nearby can also be notified of the situation and can decide to provide different aid to the civilians and to the firefighters in that area. Real-time data of the fire will be provided to the public and to different organizations during the fire and after the fire has been extinguished. The data will include things like soil humidity of the area near the devices, time and date of the fire, time taken to extinguish the fire, the location of the device which spotted the fire, images and video footage of the fire and temperature during the fire. Satellite images from NASA of the affected area will also be provided for estimation of the damage of the fire. We made a prototype which shows different weather information on different locations using the Google Maps API. Firstly, we used Python requests to get data from the data.gov.hk. Then, we passed the data with mm. the Pandas extension. After that, we changed the location data to altitude, longitude format with the help of Google Geocoding API and converted the Python dictionary data in JSON format. We passed the JSON data in JavaScript with jQuery and visualized the weather data with Google Maps API. And I will show my our program now. Wait, and the F, can you stop? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, we put our we put our data in our GitLab. You can open it, and our real time we can run it here. You can reload it, and it will show all up all the humanity data near you. Okay. You can see it's a real life. It's really can we can really use this is a real time demo. It will show you the humanity. It even can show you your location. This is your local current location. It can show you and we write it with the panda. And this is the Google Cloud API. We can use this to call the Google Map the program is the, this is the program which we get data and put it into a JSON file. And this is the HTML file that we show on the website. This is the JavaScript file that transfer the JSON file to the data that we need to use. And, and but it current only available for Hong Kong. And only three about three minutes one time because there's some limit in the API. Thank you. Okay, yeah, cool. Um nice demo. Um I see the demo. So other judges, do you have any question? Uh, we're not done. Yes, we have. Uh, we still have haven't have demonstrated. Two, you have two minutes left, so let's leave the two minutes to the judges. Okay. I thought we have ten minutes for presentation and another five minutes for questions. Uh, it will be ten minutes altogether. Oh. But uh, in the email, it says each team will be given five to ten minutes for pitching demo, followed by five minutes for of Q and A. Yeah, that's the message from Alex. Actually, that was the wrong information, but it doesn't matter, right? So if you want more time, um, how about cut short the presentation and just see the demo? So we 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 have the judges who can ask questions and you can present and demo at the same time. That goes together with their question. So how about? Okay, okay. Uh, ask questions. Ask questions. If I could ask a question, I, it, by the way, I, I've spent many years in California, so forest fires are something that definitely 
I, I know the impact of, and I, I really appreciate y'all taking on the challenge of coming up with solutions on how to detect and also fight uh, these very, very deadly fires and very damaging fires. Um, and, and I like how very specific you're, you've taken this. You've taken it down to a very small geographical area to do your analysis and collect data. You mentioned putting sensors out there to collect the data as well as potentially do firefighting activities. And I'm just wondering how, if, how many of these sensors and firefighting devices would you need to actually get installed? Um, or rather for one device, how much area could it cover? Um, because you know, California is enormous. It's a huge area. Thank you, uh, Chiwe, I see the time. We will need a large amount of those devices. But those devices, they actually track the areas. They can be put on trees and light posts and they track the area of like of a few meters around it. Like maybe like 10 to like 15 meters around around the tree or around the post which it was deployed, which it was put on, onto. Uh, it, it will track the area for small fire. The, the camera will track the area for small flames or fires or potential fire risk there. And it will try to put out the fire before it, before it, before it spreads to other areas. However, if it detects like medium sized fire, fires in the 10 to 50 meters area, it will notify the authorities of, of it. And the authorities can send firefighters to finish, to uh, extinguish the fire. So our team, you want to demo something? Last 30 seconds. You want to show some damage? Wait a minute. Um, please don't count yet because I'm going to pre Sorry, no, is it? No more demo, right? I think we can move on to the next okay, question. Let's move on to the next one. Right. The next team has Katon. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, right, Team Hefkaton. Are you ready? Yes, we're ready. I'm starting the clock now. Okay, thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hannah, and with me are Evelyn, Yitzioi, Yanis, Annette, and Valerie from Team Hefkaton. Today, we would like to present to you the work that we've done these few days for the 2020 NASA Space App Challenge Hackathon. Climate change is a very important issue in the world, and due to human activity, lots of greenhouse gases are emitted and the greenhouse effect becomes more significant, causing climate change. Apart from climate change, the, diver di the biodiversity in the world is also being destroyed and air pollution is getting more serious. These three ideas are tied together in many ways, so it is important to conserve our planet. To promote these concepts, we have created three different products revolving around three different age groups to promote the concept of climate change and combating it to save the environment. We have an app for children, a Discord chatbot directed at teenagers, and a website for everyone. Our app is called Marine Journey, Avoid the Plastic. This game aims to discourage the use of plastics as a method of alleviating climate change. As the children can see from our game, the excessive plastic use and improper waste management on both an individual and societal level is, detri is detrimental for the aquatic environment and marine biodiversity. Let's look at the demonstration. You can also scan this QR code to play it yourself. We have intentionally made the app quite difficult to obtain a perfect score so young people can understand how hard it is for marine life to avoid the litter we throw in the ocean and the fish often get trapped. We think that our app can have the following improvements. We will move on to the Discord chat box. Okay, uh, so our Discord chatbot is called Hackathon Bot, and it allows users to learn about climate change through interactions. I will now do a live demonstration of our commands. So first, we have a trivia command. Uh, first, we have a fact command, sorry, uh, which suggests, uh, which gives you a random fact about climate change, followed by an act command, which suggests a simple action that will make a difference in combating climate change. We have also implemented trivia game uh, with a leaderboard system to promote healthy competition all across Discord, which may motivate users to do research on climate change and, lose, and uh, learn more. If you answer the correct answer, you can, you can level up on the leaderboard. 
We also have commands to generate links to our website and machine learning data and join our Discord server or invite our bot to your Discord server. This chatbot helps spread awareness by using a prevalent social platform and providing an interactive experience. Many teenagers use Discord and we believe that using this platform will extend our reach further. We hope that eventually we will be able to add more functions to the bot, such as the one listed on the slide. Now, I will introduce the website. We create our website with Ripley. We hope to inspire people to learn more about climate change and take action. I will introduce the four main parts of our website and show how can and show how can we how do we visualize NASA data. So the first part is the forum. Some possible is the share is the share part, and there's a forum in the share part. Some possible solutions to climate change are included in the forum page. People can discuss how to need a sustainable life. We hope people can be more motivated to go green through discussing with others. And there's also a poll, which a few thoughts provoking questions are included in the website. People can join the poll and share their opinions. And in the related issues page, the courses, impacts, and solutions of issues related to the climate change, including decline in biodiversity and air pollution, are discussed. And the about page is what connects all our products together. You can, um, and it's our teammates and our neighbor division is also included there. Last but not least, there is a data part where we make use of the um, space agency data. And in the glass part, data from space agency, including global temperature, rise of sea level, the melting rate of ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are presented in a straightforward manner. The application tableau was used to create this chart. The rising sea level trend is compared to the rate of melting ice sheets in the North and South Pole. The graph can alarm people that it will be too late if we do not take action now. Machine learning is evolving in the modern day society. Therefore, we decided to involve that in our project by using it to predict the future trends of global warming. However, because of the lack of data in 2016 to 2020, we are only able to predict the trend with the global land temperature after 2015. During 1980 to 2016, the global land temperature has been constant and the prediction of the temperature from 2016 to 2035 also comes out stable. This shows that if we were to pre uh, protect the environment like how we did before, the global temperature would have been stable and sustainability will be achieved. We used two prediction algorithms. The first one is the naive algorithm and the other one is the Arima algorithm. Naive and Arima algorithms are useful for data sets which doesn't involve dependent variables. It is a more suitable way to predict, for example, temperature, stock price over time. Both algorithms only work when there is a time series, which is the best choice for our project. Uh, so our project consists of three different products targeted at different age groups. So all of all people of different age groups can uh, can uh, this, so this message of sustainability can be spread in a more effective way. So it's a well-rounded project. Next. Undeniably, people of different generations may have differences. A one-size-fits-all solution may not be optimal for the majority, and thus it may not bring our our message effectively. Therefore, our project consists of three different products targeted at different age groups, each using different platforms to interact with them in different ways to create the maximum appeal and relatability for the target users in order to spread this message of sustainability in the most effective way. Through our children, experience, we have learned a lot, not only about coding and machine learning, but also about sustainability and how it impacts us. Climate change and its related issues are directly tied to us human beings, so we should do what we can to make a difference. That is what our motto, One Earth, One Lifetime, means. Here's the end of our presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, we can move on to the questions now. Great. Um, I just have one quick question. How did uh, this call chatbot connect with uh, the other components you have presented? Um, you can actually access the other components through uh, the Discord command. Like you can, you can type website into the Discord, and the website will show. And so you have the platforms up all linked together. Like the website, we have the Discord bot and also the app. Um, in Discord, we also have both um, 
the app and also the, the website. However, the app, we didn't incorporate that because it's um, for children. We think that the, it's not that suitable for them to um, to feed so much information in, into them. So we decided to do it in this arrangement. And additionally, some of our data oh, visual, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, some of our data visualization is also in the Discord. And I think it's in the bot. And so I think that would, that kind of also ties everything together. Cool. Other judges? Hi, this is Tony at the U.S. Consulate. Again, great presentation. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, one of my questions is whenever you're developing a new product, you want to know who your competitors are, who's providing something similar. So for you guys, have you looked at that? Is there, are there people providing similar things? And if so, how, are, how is yours different or better? And if not, uh, then maybe why not? That's all. Um, we have actually done some research on similar projects, but the, I think the um, the thing that makes us stick out is we are well rounded because we actually have like a bot and um, and a game and um, machine learning and also a website for all people. But um, for the research we have done, um, I've seen that actually people are ma maybe only making an app or maybe only making a bot. So I think uh, our project actually ties all of the things together. So people. Um, will be just and we educate and people on use, um, sorry, using an interactive approach so people can learn about it easily, not just fitting information to them. And that's what we stand, That's why we stand out. Uh, one thing is uh, we believe that there are also apps and websites about climate change, but we are most likely the first people to develop a Discord bot related. At least when uh, I did a quick search on the Discord bot list, I don't think there was any other bot related to climate change. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, may I ask if uh, the, you have mentioned about using the time series data, but uh, have uh, what will uh, um, what will uh, start networks like uh, recurrent neural networks or um, LSTM perform with the uh, tasks you are working on? I'm sorry, do you mind repeating again? Because there's um, there uh, you you didn't speak too clearly just now. Do you mind speaking again? Thank you. Oh, okay, so. Uh, you have mentioned about the uh, time series data, but uh, I'm wondering, but how will LSTM perform uh, compared to your algorithm-based uh, method? Um, because um, naive and um, 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 Arema algorithms both are, are really simple. Um, like, um, it's easier to predict trends that is um, actually like temperature and also um, um, there's like a flux because there, there's going to be a fluctuate fluctuating trend um, for it's because it's a seasonal pattern so we think that the most suitable way is to do to do these two methods uh, two algorithms and other than that because we're not very familiar with we're not the best in um, machine learning so we didn't um, actually incorporate like a lot of machine learning we just wanted to show our idea and also our basic concept on it I believe that um there are a lot of other places with a lot of machine learning. So um uh, I believe that um uh, us doing this um it is uh it is um it helps. But then um I believe that we should um use our strengths in places such as the Discord bot and put more effort in uh, trying to promote it to more people. Okay, cool. Thank you very much for the question. So uh, let's move on to the next team. Thank you, uh, team have got on. So the next team is uh, team. Sunflower coconut. Are you ready? Team Sunflower Coconut, are you ready? Yes, I think we're ready. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. We're Team Sunflower Coconut, working on Spot That Fire version 3. Um, are you muted? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, 
Hello everyone, this is Team Sunflower Coconut, and our project is to create a one-stop tool with machine learning to mitigate the effects of wildfires on humans and the biosphere in real time all around the world. So wildfires are a significant issue, and which is also explained by groups before us. So there are a lot of wildfires annually that we aren't predicting right now. So that's why we want to make a difference through our project. Firstly, we created lar large new open source binary fire scene classification data sets from um, other sources, which this is currently one of the largest sources online. And we have a fire detection module, which uses real-time lightweight cross-platform with efficient net. And we have a real-time fire risk calculator and a damage assessment model. Yeah, so in terms of detection, here's what we did. We leveraged computer vision artificial intelligence techniques to per perform real-time detection of wildfires. We framed this as a binary classification problem, meaning given an input image, we detect whether or not a fire is present at that frame. To do this, we ran, our, we, we ran into our first challenge, which is that there is no sufficiently large open source data set available for fire detection training. Hence, our first contribution, compiling the data set available, um, uh, an open source open access fire and smoke image data set. We scraped royalty free images and images under the MIT license, as well as used OpenCV to retrieve the frame by frame images from videos of wildfires, compiling a data set of nearly 330,000 uh, 30, images. After compiling the data set, our second contribution is creating a model for the classification and detection of fires. We leveraged EfficientNet and MobileNet v3 for these tasks. EfficientNet introduces a novel compound scaling method, which completely rethinks the composition and optimization of compnets through coherent scaling of network depth, width, and input resolution parameters. EfficientNet is ideal for this task as it balances both computational resource efficiency and accuracy, achieving state-of-the-art performance on the ImageNet benchmark. We also experimented with MobileNet, which utilizes depth-wise separable convolutions and enables model pruning. Evaluating on our test set, we achieve an accuracy of 93%, which can be hugely improved given a larger data set. Last but not least, we propose a method based on the NASA satellite image data to improve upon the existing space wildfire detection algorithm used by NASA, namely MODIS. MODIS performs segmentation of satellite imagery, um, classifying each pixel into water, land, fire, and etc. We propose to utilize deep learning on the Terra satellite fire radioactive uh, power image dataset provided by NASA through UNET and nested UNET to improve segmentation results. UNET is an application of the fully convolutional networks architecture, a special encoder decoder model which enhances fusion of local to global spatial semantic features. We propose to, to leverage UNET with nested dense skip pathways as shown here and deep supervision to form nested UNET in order to surpass NASA's current fire segmentation methods. So we have also uh, pre prepared uh, a, a fire protection model. So... Yes, yeah, so... Uh, maybe, so uh, I'll talk a little about the fire prediction model. Um, so we actually did a lot of web scraping from the NASA data set because they have tons of data, um, which is daily. And uh, there were like, uh, we, we took like one year of time series data, which had like over two gigabytes of data. Afterwards, we experimented with different techniques, uh, such as um, simple uh, SVM support vector machine, simple like class, uh, a simple classifier, and also we we and because of um, like GPU resources availability uh, reasons, we weren't able to train like uh, we weren't able to train an LSTM yet, but we are currently training like some other uh, more advanced modules, such as uh, a CNN on that data, as well as an LSTM. Uh, we are planning to do this. And yeah, that concludes our fire prediction uh, module. And in terms of, does anyone want to take the damage assessment part? Okay, so uh, the damage assessment 
assess the damage of the uh, different uh, 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 caused by wildfire using uh, uh, again different uh, techniques. So for uh, ecological damage, uh, we can we can use uh, some sort of uh, maybe regression or uh, even uh, some sort of, uh, conclusion or to uh, assess the damage of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the nearby areas and the human uh, cost areas. We can use uh, we can use some uh, uh, we can use some uh, 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 maybe some regression. Yes, exactly. So what's different about our idea is that most, um, basically, uh, we see that what NASA has currently done is that they only assess the area of uh, the burned area. So they only calculate how much of land is burnt by a fire and they do not they do not consider other factors such as the ecological damage of wildfires or the human cost. So we, in terms of our, um, what we propose to do is that we propose to consider two perspectives, firstly being ecological so uh, how would that fire damage the habitats of um, endangered animals or how would that like uh, and yeah and also we consider the human cost point of view which is like how many people are displaced by this fire as um, so uh, earlier in California a lot of people lost their homes and so we were mapping nearby settlements and population density data and estimating the depths and also um, how many people are uh, displaced as well as e uh, economical and ecological cost of fire. So we believe that this is a fresh approach which definitely is beneficial to uh, really understanding the whole extent of like the damage as well as uh, as well as the cost of um, fires, wildfires um, cur currently, yes. So uh, in terms of the, the data we used, here is an exhaustive list. And as stated earlier, we also uh, propose our own data set, which is the largest open source and open access data available on fire prediction. <clears throat> Finally, in the end, we hope that our models can be able to help through um, noticing fires from surveillance cameras or even in the cameras of normal people and predict real-time fire risk as current fire risk predictions are made by governments annually. We hope that we can make this prediction based on current events and to predict the potential impact so that the authorities have more time to prepare. And instead of like knowing one year in advance, they can know about it, know about more details one week in advance, which could help more. Thank you. This is the end of our presentation. We're open to questions from judges and the floor. Judges, uh, any question? Uh, yeah, this is Todd real quick, if I could. Uh, Anthony mentioned you need to consider often who your competitor is when you're designing a, a business or a solution. Here, especially when you talk about the damage assessment part of your offering, who do you think would be your customers for that? Who do you think would be maybe somebody that would actually pay for that information? Uh, we think that would be governments because um, they're basically responsible for the well-being of their citizens. And currently, there is no comprehensive and uh, no no good mod module for predicting like uh, the whole extent of uh, the cost of, um, of wildfires. So we believe that our model would be hugely popular for governments around the world. Do you think any private sector, non-government people might be interested in paying for this? Uh, we, yeah, I, I don't see why not. Farmers, ranchers, they can all make use of our products. Yes. And also um, people from like vacation spots with woodlands, maybe. Mm. And maybe insurance companies too. Definitely. Good. Thank you. Any other question from the judges or from anyone? So I just have one quick question. How big is your train data set? Our training data set is, um, uh, let me CD into, it's around um, 20, 23K images. Uh, I'll just right now list how many, ah, yes. 20, oh, 27,321 images. 
Yes. How, and big is that How big is that model? The model is uh, you're we. Sell that. You're going to sell that thing. So, how much is, how big is that, and how much do you think you're going to sell that thing? Uh, in terms of the price, we haven't, uh, we haven't exactly, uh, well, we haven't talked about a price yet, but um, in terms of how big the model is, um, it's uh, basically in, in machine learning, you, uh, you want a, a model that's as small as possible so that it doesn't, so that it can be run fast, like as fast, like fast in, in real time. So our model is actually very lightweight. And um, so it, so we use the efficient, efficient net model, which basically scales the different trainable parameters coherently, as in um, it minimizes the, it, it uses the minimal number of trainable parameters to achieve state of the art eff uh, efficiency and detection accuracy, which is basically ideal for these companies who want to detect fires in real time. Okay, cool, good, yep. So let's move to the last team, team you and I. Team, you and I, are you there? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Hello, yep. Yeah, I'm uh, throwing the uh, prototype on my screen. Just give me a sec. Uh, can you see my screen? Hello, can you see the screen? Yes, I can see. Okay. So your, t your time starts now. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone here uh, today. Well, uh, our team has taken up the challenge to putting uh, the complicated NASA data sets and putting them into like uh, visually representable data set, uh, visually representable figures for the general public to see, which we could further on use for uh, education or information or so or so. So uh, let's begin. So uh, we all know that the hottest topic, quite literally, in the world right now is climate change. And most people think it's bad, but we don't know how bad it is, right? So in the past, university students or researchers or professionals could access to NASA data sets and draft the data themselves. But me as a business student, or even let's say a primary or secondary school student, when I go into the sites, they have no idea what they are looking at. And trust me, because I have no idea what I was looking at, which is why our team developed you and I. Especially given the experiences we've had during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we realized that the most efficient way uh, to demonstrate knowledge or to demonstrate data is through a mobile application which is why we de developed a mobile application to visualize all the confusing numbers on uh, the data, set, data sets that NASA site offers so that the gen general public can make use of this data and do whatever they want with it. But who are our primary uh, targets, you might ask? Well, our first primary target would be, let's say, primary school or secondary school uh, teachers. As you know, data is extremely complicated and usually professionals are the only ones who can interpret it. But with our mobile application, we aim to let students from primary schools or secondary schools to download them and maybe interactively use it with their teachers to um, grasp more knowledge about the world around them. Also, another usage um, for our application might be for professionals. For example, let's say farmers who want to know about uh, whether data around their area or so. So uh, let's jump into the application. As uh, due to the time limitations, we're just going to use the demo. So as you can see in the first page here, there's a sign in and register. Our application UNI actually has a database for uh, users to register their own accounts, which I'll demonstrate right now. So uh, when you press the register button, you first go into the username, email, password page, which is, well, uh, basic for most account registrations. What comes next is what makes our application a bit more special. We will have our users in insert the date of birth, their, uh, their occupation or their country or region into into um, their own accounts. So this information is linked to our account, and then we will further use this information to recommend um, uh, relevant data for them, for example, in their area, or, uh, or uh, whether data related to their occupation. For example, uh, if you're a farmer in California, United States, I'm gonna press the next page. Just a sec, yeah. So uh, after creating an account, you will see a page of all the categories of uh, data sets that NASA has to offer. So if, for example, if you are a farmer in, uh, in California, let's say, so there's atmospheric data, land data, and rainfall data, which is obviously very crucial for uh, farmers for their uh, agricultural production. But also you can see here, we also have wildfires, which is like unique for California, as I've heard a judge mention just now, wildfires are quite a big thing in the United States or in California, especially. So wildfire is automatically selected for the user uh, as one of his favorite categories. So let's go on to the next page. 
Now, as you can see, this is what would happen after you've created your own account and selected your own categories. So uh, here's a page with all the things we call uh, news or just event data that you can see like what's happening around you. And these are actually clickable. So let's say, for example, uh, we're in California and there's aerosol optical depth update in your area. And we don't know what that is, right? So let's click into it. All right, so my partner, Kallis, is now uh, going to explain what all this means, and he's going to explain this page, basically. Kallis? Uh, yes, uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, so we here, uh, as you can see, the location that's related to the data provided below. Uh, we utilize the GIPS API for accessing near real-time imagery. So our app will call GIPS API to get the imagery layer of our planet on the from the world work view earth data nasa website so according to the what user has chosen our app will re retrieve the data uh, like here in the example aerosol optical depth uh, by calling nasa api so if the user uh, wants to see information directly from the nasa website here oh wait yeah share the screen okay sorry uh we have some technical difficulties yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, if the user wants to see the information from directly NASA website, he or she can go directly to that website by clicking this link. So, um, here also uh, the summary of the information. What does this information mean? Uh, we also use the NASA's Open API uh, in order to obtain the imager, images and the uh, and the videos for our app. Uh, we also, by using the data from the uh, NASA's website, we we also plot the graphs and the maps in order to improve the visualization of our app. Uh, so here, uh, this app also provides the data about um, uh, how you should understand this data. For example, the explanation whether uh, it is good to have the, such kind of the, uh, records for the uh, for this page and also this uh, how this data will directly affect you so we also provided some additional um, uh, functions like downloading data and the saving the snapshot yeah, as you can see demonstrated in this page we actually have um like complicated on one side but we actually uh, we also have some simpler graphics or simpler words to put into for education for primary or secondary school students and it also tends to the more professional side as you can see on the top of the page okay you can go back right now so in uh yeah uh, get, get back to for you for you okay in the for you menu there is actually also a drop down menu so if you have chosen like um, maybe you have chosen the wrong categories you could go back to the other categories and see the things around you also okay now to the global function the global function is very similar to the for you function except that it takes out the largest um, largest news or the largest effects on the environment all around the world and pushes it to your page so that you can see what's happening around the world in case you are actually feeling like you want to know more about like things not there not only just around you and also each of these these pages are extremely similar to the one we demonstrated just now, which contains um, professional data as well as some uh, easier interpretation. Okay, so the monitor function. We also have the monitoring function, as you can see here, where you can select, uh, first of all, your categories. Uh, click on the drop-down menu. Yeah. As you can see, you could uh, click, uh, select some of, uh, some of the categories here, like all of the, the data which is provided by NASA itself. So let's say, for example, you'd like to uh, to uh, like to uh, monitor atmospheric data. So you can click on atmosphere. Okay, close it. And then there's the location. The location itself, you can manually input if you would like to see data over a specific location, but you could also take it uh, from your own mobile phone where we could use the GPS to locate your current location and then automatically input it into the slot. There's also a slot, uh, start time and end time for your monitoring period. So let's say you would like to uh, see the weather data, the rain for maybe in the next five days where the rain clouds are. You could simply enter the time, start time and end time for, uh, for the particular period. So after that, you could click, um, if you selected all these things, you go into the view tab. The view tab, yeah. So as you can see, there's a view tab with uh, all the weather maps and such, like the things, the information that you have requested from the site itself. And there's a location uh, and start and end time information down below. 
Also, there's also a checkbox where you could see notify me if there is any update, for which like if there are some of the weather data uh, can affect you greatly and you would like to know about it right away, you click, click that checkbox and the, uh, and the mobile application would push notifications to your mobile phone. And there's also a download video and share uh, function where you could download the period of uh, uh, like the monitoring data over the period of the start and end time that you have chosen. So, yep, next. And also, uh, off to the settings. These are three main functions that our app actually offers. But of course, to make ourselves unique, uh, our app is different from uh, local, let's say local weather station apps because we offer a um, global accessibility with all the language and so. And NASA data sets not only restricted in any, spe uh, any specific country, but from all around the world. So let's uh, reserve last minute for Q&A. Yeah, uh, we're finished. Yeah, great. Uh, so I uh, see some demo. Uh, can you tell me what language is this written in? Your mobile? Uh, is it iOS or Android? Can you show me the code? Well, this is actually a, a prototype from Adobe XD. So there's no real code, is that right? Yeah, not real code yet. This okay, is for cool. demonstration purposes. So let me pass the stage to the other judges. Okay. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, Lots of interesting information here. I'm wondering if you thought about how, let's say we take the example of a farmer and they're getting information about hydrology, they're getting information about wind, temperature, etc. How could you turn that into something that can make their life easier? Maybe this does something for them automatically. Uh, I'd say like, for example, in the page you've seen um, just now where we had the complicated data on the top, and then it gets more, uh, it gets easier as you scroll down, like it's more simpler on like, it explains to you what it means, how it affects you. I think um, if we put uh, it, like we put those complicated data and put it in very simple words, it could affect farmers one way or another to make their lives easier. Yep. Uh, okay. Any question from the other judges and anyone? For team you and I, anyone, anyone has any question for team you and I? Uh, no other questions. So let me reserve the next five minutes for everyone to ask any question. Do you have any question, anyone, for any of those six teams? Uh, I think I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the It's for the team before the one that just went up. They were talking a lot about uh, forest fires, and they made a model uh, about predicting forest fires or, or something like that. Uh, what were they? What What was their name again? Sunflower coconut. Sunflower coconut. Okay. Um, I think they said uh, they. Okay, so th they think their model is like uh, industry standard. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, ha have they uh, put the machine learning uh, sort of algorithm to uh, make this model yet or has it not been made yet? Yes, definitely. Our machine learning model is actually available online. Um, it's open source, e including our um, database. It's also open access. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, is it? It's not working yet. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so here's the fire detection module. Um, as, uh, as you can see, we used um, efficient net, so click into efficient net and then um, you can see models and then efficient net.py is like the model. And um, yeah, here's, this is the code we used. It's all available on GitHub. Um, and here's some code. Um, we also tried uh, mobile net. So here's the code for mobile net, uh, mobile net v3. Yeah, so here's the code. Um, 
and yeah. Okay, um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to do this, but uh, would you be able to like show us an example of uh, mm -hmm. the model, like for just give an example image um, and the model showing like it predicting something? Oh. Uh. Sure. Um, we actually have uploaded a demo video onto uh, the project page. So yeah, um, let me just find demo hackathon. Um, let me see. Um, may I interrupt? So I, I, I guess uh, all the source codes and so on are available, right? On the space apps. Of yeah, the space it's, it's all available. Website. So uh, this is the, the idea we want to um, uh, get Chin Lam to educate us, right, in the future. So thank you, Chin Lam. You are a very good machine learning um, uh. um, a practitioner, right, for high school students. You are going to teach us more in time to come. So any other question for any of the teams, any of the six teams, anyone? Uh, may I invite the judge, if not, no question, may I invite the judge, uh, Toad and uh, Tony to say a few words in closing? Sure, Tony, do you want to go first or would you like me to go first? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead then. Uh, first, I just want to congratulate everybody. I, I am amazed by what you all have created. And it, there's a lot of creativity here. There's a lot of thinking about application and how the, how the information can be used. There's also a deep level of technical skill that um, I'm going to brag a little bit here. I did go to MIT, but today I feel very humbled. Um, really saw so much capability here, and it really is encouraging um, for, for the future. And really impressed that you all have taken the time and the effort and, and put so much energy into this and come up with so many cool things. And I encourage you to keep doing it every single day. Just keep thinking about what you can do to make things better, to come up with creative solutions and make a better planet. And uh, I thank you. Thank you, To. Thank you. Uh, Tony, do you want to say something? Uh, no. So, so that's it, uh, everyone. Uh, we see a lot of fantastic... Um, ideas in this pitching session. So we are going to come back to you with the final, final judge uh, outcome. So the judges are going to be very busy, right? Deciding who will be the two global nominees that we will recommend to NASA for the final competition. We will get in touch very soon. So uh, till then, thank you very much, everyone. See you, bye-bye. <laughs>